Hello everyone, welcome to 10 Minute Physiology. In today's video, I'm gonna give you a short explanation as to how excitation contraction coupling occurs in the skeletal muscle. So with that, let's give it a go. So I'd like to start off by first talking about the organization of skeletal muscle. So it's important to realize that skeletal muscle is striated muscle, and skeletal muscle is going to be very highly organized. So the first part of organization, or the first level of organization in skeletal muscle, is going to be the muscle itself. So this picture here is a picture of the skeletal muscle, and the skeletal muscle is going to be surrounded by the epimesium. So the epimesium is just a protective sheath that surrounds a skeletal muscle. Each skeletal muscle is going to consist of multiple bundles. So multiple bundles make up a skeletal muscle, and these bundles are going to be called fascicles. So the fascicles are basically going to be bundles of muscle fibers, and these bundles are going to be surrounded by perimesium. Now, the third level of organization is going to be the muscle fiber, and muscle fibers are individual muscle cells, and these muscle fibers are going to be surrounded by endomesium. And then the last level of organization, the second last level, is going to be the myo fibrils. So the myofibril is going to be a linear arrangement of contractile fibers. So basically what makes up the myofibril is going to be sarcomeres that are arranged adjacent to each other. So these linear arrangements of sarcomeres is what's going to make up the my myofibril. So sarcomeres, we're not really going to talk about in this video, but sarcomeres are the contractile units of skeletal muscle. So they are going to be arrangements of actin and myosin, and they are going to be responsible for contracting skeletal muscle. So we're not really going to talk about the sarcomere, but I just showed this to you in order to show you how organized skeletal muscle is. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the region of a muscle cell where excitation contraction coupling is going to occur. And this is going to be in the triad junction. So what is the triad junction? So the triad junction is going to be a specific region inside a skeletal muscle cell that is going to be responsible for excitation contraction coupling. So before we get into the triad junction, I want to first show you the, a specific region called the sarcolemma. So the sarcolemma is the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. Now the triad junction is going to be made of three parts. So the first component of the triad junction is the T-tubule. So the T-tubule is going to basically be this deep valley that is inside the sarcolemma and it goes really deep into the cytosol, then comes back up. Now, the second two parts of the triad junction are going to be the terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which we see here in blue, is going to be important because it has a very high concentration of calcium. And calcium is going to be responsible for initiating contraction. So the three parts of the triad junction are going to be the T-tubule and its two neighboring cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So now that we know how muscle cells are organized and where the excitation contraction coupling is going to occur, let's talk about how excitation contraction coupling occurs in a muscle cell. So when we think about excitation contraction coupling, there are two main channels that you have to worry about. The first one is going to be the DHP receptor, and the second one is going to be the ryanidine receptor. So the first receptor we're going to talk about is the DHP receptor. So what is that? Well, the DHP receptor is, it looks like this, and basically what it is is a group of L-type calcium channels. So these L-type calcium channels are called DHP receptors because they are inhibited by the molecule DHP. Now, these receptors are found inside the sarcolemma. So they're inside the sarcolemma, inside the T-tubules. And typically, these DHP receptors are going to be found in these 
clusters. So basically, DHP receptors are a cluster of four L-type calcium channels. So we see one L-type calcium channel here, number two, number three, and then number four is in the back. So all four of these are calcium channels that are organized into a tetrad. Now, as you can see here, each of these channels is going to be made up of four subunits. So how are these channels going to be open? Well, in order to open, you have to have depolarization. So when depolarization comes in, it causes a conformational change in each of these channels, which causes the pores to open. And when the pores open, it allows calcium to flow through the pore into the cytosol. So that is going to be the DHP receptor. So now that we know what the DHP receptor is, let's talk about the ryanidine receptor and how it interacts with the DHP receptor. So this blue receptor below the DHP receptor is the ryanidine receptor. So the ryanidine receptor is called the ryanidine receptor because it is inhibited by the molecule ryanidine. Now, these receptors are going to be found in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and they too are going to be made up of four subunits. So it is a individual channel that's made up of four subunits. So when you have depolarization, which causes a conformational change inside the DHP receptor, causing the DHP receptor to open, this conformational change is actually also going to be translated into the ryanidine receptor. And the reason why is because some of the ryanidine receptors are actually mechanically coupled to the DHP receptor. So in other words, when a DHP receptor opens, the ryanidine receptor that's mechanically coupled to it is going to open as well. And when it opens, it allows calcium to flow from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytosol. So this process of mechanical coupling is going to be called DICR, or depolarization-induced calcium released. So in other words, when you have a depolarization which causes the DHP receptors to open, this conformational change is translated into the ryanidine receptor, which causes it to open, and it allows calcium to flow into the cell from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this is called DICR. So how do these things come together in excitation contraction coupling? So let's say that you have an action potential that propagates down the T-tubule and it hits this DHP receptor. So when the depolarization hits the DHP, what's going to happen is it's going to cause the DHP receptor to open through a conformational change. And this conformational change is going to be translated to the ryanidine receptor that is mechanically coupled to it. So when this occurs, you have calcium that flows out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytosol. So this process, remember, is called depolarization-induced calcium release. And this part is going to be responsible for what's called the calcium spark. So the calcium spark is basically going to be an initial transient increase in calcium concentration, which will lead to the initiation of the cross-bridge cycle. So the cross-bridge cycle is going to be responsible for contraction. And we're going to talk about what the cross-bridge cycle is in another video. So this part right here, DICR, is responsible for the calcium spark. So that's only half of the story. So the second half of the story has to do with the ryanidine receptors that are not coupled to DHP receptors. So these receptors are going to bind to the calcium that was released from the mechanical coupling process, and it will open the ryanidine receptors, allowing calcium to flow into the cell. So this process of calcium inducing calcium release is going to be called calcium induced calcium release or CICR. So that is how calcium is going to be increased inside the cell and and as a result cause contraction. So how is contraction going to be terminated? So the answer to this question is that in order to terminate uh, contraction, you need to decrease the level of calcium. 
So the first thing that is going to be important for decreasing the calcium concentration inside the cytosol is going to be the sodium-potassium pump. So the sodium-potassium pump, as you may know, uses ATP to pump three sodiums out of the cell and two potassiums into the cell. Now the sodium-potassium pump is not directly responsible for removing calcium from the cell, but it's going to be incredibly important for powering transporters that do. So the transporter that's going to be powered by the electrochemical grade, gradient generated by the sodium-potassium pump is going to be the sodium-calcium exchanger. So the sodium-calcium exchanger is going to pump cal one calcium into the extracellular fluid and then three sodium into the cell. So what this exchanger is doing is it's using the electrical chemical gradient of sodium to power the uphill transport of calcium. So when sodium moves down its gradient, it releases energy, which allows calcium to be moved up its gradient. So that is the first way in which calcium is removed from the cytosol. So the second way is through the plasma membrane calcium ATPase, or PMCA. So PMCA pumps one calcium out of the cell and one proton into the cell. And it does this through the action of hydrolyzing ATP. So when it hydrolyzes ATP, it releases energy, which allows calcium to be pumped against its gradient out of the cell. So that is the second way in which calcium is removed from the cell. So the third way in which calcium is removed from the cell is through circa. So circa is a pump that is inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum that pumps calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this pump is going to use ATP, the hydrolysis of ATP, to pump two calcium into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and two protons out. So all three of these things are going to be responsible for reducing calcium. But uh, in the context of circa, we actually have a problem. And this problem is that circa is actually inhibited by a high calcium concentration inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So how does the cell get around this? Well, the one way it gets around this is through two calcium binding proteins called calcireticulin and calcisequestrin. So both of these proteins are going to bind to calcium and decrease the free concentration of calcium inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So by decreasing the level of free calcium, this is going to increase the storage capacity of the sarcoplasmic reticulum by basically preventing calcium from inhibiting the circa pump. So in other words, these proteins come in, they pick up calcium, and, these ca and by picking up calcium, they prevent calcium from inhibiting the circa protein, and it allows circa to bring more calcium inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So that's how calcium is going to be removed from the cytosol. So in summary, we talked about that how skeletal muscle is a striated muscle, and we also talked about how it's highly organized. We also talked about the triad junction, the different receptors that are responsible for the process. We talked about DICR and CICR, and we also talked about how contraction is terminated. So I hope this video helped you understand excitation contraction coupling. And I hope to see you in the next video. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you next time.